Okay, guys. So today we're going to cover topic seven in the IB computer science curriculum. This only appears on paper one of the HL exam. The topic of topic seven is control systems. So when we're talking about control systems, we're basically talking about a system in which there is some input, uh, that input is processed, and there is some output. In the context of the IB computer science exam, we're going to be talking about digital input from a sensor. And that digital signal from the sensor is going to be sent to a microprocessor, which is a smaller version of a computer's CPU. It essentially is a tiny computer. That microprocessor is going to process the signal. And then based on that signal, it's going to emit some digital output, which will be used to control another device. Now, a great example of this is a refrigerator. So in a refrigerator, we will have a temperature sensor. That temperature sensor will constantly feed a digital signal to a microprocessor located in the refrigerator. And that microprocessor will check whether the current temperature matches the desired temperature. Based on that, it will send a digital signal to the, to the cooling element in the refrigerator to either warm up or cool down the, the refrigerator or just do nothing. Now, broadly speaking, in a, in a control system, there are three specific components. There is the sensor, the microprocessor, and the actuator. So the sensor is feeding data into the microprocessor um, based on the environment around it. The microprocessor is processing that data and then feeding a new signal to the actuators, which will actually take action based on the input. So a great example here, similar to our refrigerator signal, our refrigerator example is a fire, I guess a fire detection, a system to put out fire, a fire hazard system. Anyways, we have a temperature sensor that detects heat. That sensor is sending a signal to our control center, which contains a microprocessor. Based on that signal, we're going to, that microprocessor is going to output a signal to our actuator. And our actuator is going to either output water um, if it's hotter than it should be, or just do nothing. So the actuator is actually taking some physical action based on the digital signal that has been fed to it by the microprocessor. Now a microprocessor is an integrated circuit. So it's basically just a chip that looks like this. It contains all the functions of a computer's CPU. So think about an ALU arithmetic, logical, and control operations. Generally, we'll accept uh, electrical signals on one side and output from another side. And its role more broadly is to perform calculations and data processing. Now, transducers are the broad term for both sensors and actuators. They don't confirm, that's a typo. They convert one form of energy into another. So for example, a heat sensor will take heat energy and convert that into electrical energy an electrical signal. A microphone right here will take uh, sound energy and convert that into electrical energy, which will be fed into a microprocessor, a controller, of which I guess there's just an amplifier here. Um, an actuator similarly will take electrical energy from the microprocessor and convert that in this case to sound energy. Um, in the case of our, in the case right here, basically takes uh, electrical energy and probably in, con in conjunction with more energy from another source, will turn that into physical energy to push water out onto a flame. So to conclude what transducers basically convert one form of energy into another, and sensors and actuators are both examples of, transdu of transducers. So in every control system, so in every control system, we are using some form of transducers. Now, a sensor is a device which detects or measures a physical property and records, indicates, or otherwise responds to it. So these are all examples of sensors. They basically um, sense some sort of physical property, or something in the environment around it. And then, especially in the context of IV computer science, they generate an electrical signal in response. These are, all, these are a variety of different types of sensors. You don't need to know all of these. Um, but I would just recommend looking through this list to familiarize, to familiarize yourself with the type of sensors that could exist. Um, because many times you will have, um, you'll have IB questions that will ask you um, what kind of sensor could you use in order to accomplish this task or may refer to, a set, to one of these sensors 
and ask you to write a response based on that. So it's not essential to necessarily memorize these, but make sure you do look through this list and are just aware of this terminology and what it's referring to. Now an actuator, as we talked about before, converts input energy of one form to another, which is usually an electrical signal that's converted to physical motion in the case of uh, IV computer science. Now every actuator requires a control device, which is our microprocessor, and a source of energy. So going back to our example right here, or even right here. So in this case, we had a microprocessor here that delivered an electrical signal, and the actuator getting the electrical signal from the microprocessor and also electrical, electrical energy from another source is able to accomplish the task of pushing water out onto this flame. Now, some types of actuators can be a light bulb, which will generate or which will display light or create light based on electric, electrical signal and some other energy. A heater, a motor, um, specifically applies to robots, washing machines, or elevators, for example. A pump or a buzzer or bell. So these are all things that will react to an electrical signal, um, either physically um, in terms of releasing heat energy, uh, releasing light energy, or sound. Now, um, in talking about sensors specifically, we, can, we need to talk about analog to digital converters. So analog to digital converters con convert an analog, a non-digital signal, which could be um, some sort of sound signal, maybe a touch, a physical action, or something else that does not have a digital character, meaning, meaning the data is not uh, represented in ones and zeros. So it's taking those at the analog data, those analog signals, and converting them into a digital binary signal that represents ones and zeros. That is an analog to digital converter um, of which any sensors you're going to use, again, in the IB computer science context, are going to have an analog to digital conversion element to it. So a sensor is going to have that, or you might deliver analog data to a sensor to a microprocessor that has an ADC attached to it. Now, broadly, when we're talking about, when we're talking about um, control systems, we're following an input process output model. So sensors are taking an analog input and converting them to digital data. It's right here. The digital data is processed by the microprocessor and is output, and it outputs a different digital uh, signal or a different digital data to basically tell our output mechanism what to do. And then once this output is received, so then we're going to have output. And then based on the output, we might send some feedback um, back to our sensors, which will then continue the process. So transducers are responsible for turning digital data into some sort of physical motion, both here and here. Feedback is basically taking some action based on the results of the output. We will get to that in our next slide. OK, so let's talk about feedback. So basically what's happening, what feedback is, um, if we look back at our input process output model, is when we are basically sending some initial input to our system. So initially sending a digital signal to the system, the processor processes that signal, um, and then it outputs a certain, so there's some sort of output, right? And then based on the output and potentially other environmental factors, we are sending a signal uh, back to our system, back to our uh, processor, uh, telling, it to, telling it what to do, basically telling it that, OK, um, we are sending a signal back to you. And now based on this, you need to generate some more output. So again, we're sending an input to our microprocessor. The microprocessor is sending a signal to the output to take some kind of action. And then based on the result of that action and potentially other environmental factors, we're sending a signal back to our microprocessor. And we're going to repeat that process until we've achieved an optimal result. Now, that's kind of abstract, but let's, let's see what that means in sort of real terms by looking at different types of feedback loops, because this is really a loop. So the first type of feedback loop is an open loop system. And this basically means that there is no feedback at all. We put in, a, for example, with a toaster, which is probably one of the better uh, examples, we put in a timer level, so how long we want to toast for, and then we, and then we basically toast the, the bread. So our output is really bread color, like how toasty the bread is. And then we don't take any further action based on that bread color. We toasted it, and we're done. And we're not automatically sending the results of that toasting back to the toaster and then taking some action. 
So this is an open loop system. Now really where we're engaging with feedback is in a closed loop system. So this is an example of a dryer, okay? So we have some initial dryness we want. So we're telling the dryer, okay, we want our clothes to be this dry. So initially we send that to our microprocessor. That microprocessor accordingly sends a signal to our heating elements, um, which heat the clothes. And then based on the dryness of our clothes, which is going to be detected by a sensor, we're going to send a signal back to the controller. Now this controller is going to measure our current dryness versus our desired dryness and accordingly send another signal to our heating element. Now, this may be a signal to do nothing, or it might just be a signal to continue drying until we reach this desired dryness that was initially input. Now that's an example of a feedback loop. We have some initial desired result and we continue to run the system. We continue to run the system until we achieve that desired result. Um, adjusting the operations of our actuator based on how close we are to that result. Some other examples include home thermostat, a home thermostat, and an airplane autopilot, which is constantly adjusting to keep us going in the right direction towards our desired destination. So we're giving our system an initial objective, an initial, basically we're telling it what we want. The system takes action based on that and then continues to give feedback uh, to the controller until we have achieved what we want our system to achieve. Now we have two other types of negative feedback loops. So we have two other types of feedback loops that represent a slightly different context. Now if we have a control system in which feedback is given in order to reduce fluctuation in subsequent output, or basically to move output closer to some equilibrium, that's a negative feedback loop. So let's say we have um, Try to think of a good example here. So let's say we have a system that wants to reduce the vibration of a car, wants to give you a smoother ride, right? So in that case, we are trying to make the whole system much more stable and move closer to some target value, which is zero vibration in your car. And maybe things, maybe we're adjusting the, the uh, shocks, maybe we're adjusting different things that are going on in the car until we achieve that. That's an example of a negative feedback loop. So we're basically taking some actions with feedback to have a consistent output or to, to achieve some consistent state. Um, probably like another example would be stabilizing an airplane after takeoff, right? So if we had an automated system to stabilize an airplane, we wanna achieve, um, we want the airplane to be probably pointed in some position for the wings to not be moving. And our airplane is going to probably uh, change the settings on its engine and it's probably going to change the uh, probably like the um, the movement of its wings or the position of certain parts of its wings until we get to a stable state in which the aircraft is stabilized and we're which effectively represents some kind of equilibrium all right so with a negative feedback loop, loop we're looking for stability to get to some equilibrium a positive feedback loop is basically the opposite we want to basically move as far away from equilibrium as possible. So we want to um, enhance or amplify changes in output to basically create chaos, right? So probably an example of a positive feedback loop would be, I'm trying to think of like a bomb of some sort. Um, probably a good example would be probably a mine. Because I guess a mine is taking some input and is, well, actually, uh, that doesn't really have any feedback though, because it just kind of blows up. Um, I'm trying to think of it like a weapon system that continually like keeps acting until it has like sort of just created the most chaotic output. This is going to be kind of unorthodox, but I actually do have a great example of a positive feedback loop that has nothing to do with computer science. So maybe, maybe if you've ever had a girlfriend or boyfriend that constantly seeks to um, seeks to create chaos, seeks to create situations in which people are angry at each other. In which people, um, in which people are just generally unhappy, in which there's some kind of drama, and wherever they go, their goal is to create as much drama as possible. That is a great example of a positive feedback loop, right? Because that person is basically taking their environmental circumstances as input, and then they're doing everything they can that's possible in order to amplify that and to, in order to amplify whatever is going on, 
and just create a situation that is more chaotic than what currently exists to essentially move everything away from the, equ the equilibrium in a given social situation. Honestly, that's probably the best example of a positive feedback loop I can think of. Versus maybe a negative feedback loop in this same, um, if we're talking about the same analogy, would be someone who seeks to be a consensus builder, someone who's calm, who seeks to, if there's perhaps a, um, a, a, a situation with conflict or if there's a conflict, that person seeks to mediate the conflict and to create stability in any sort of social situation to calm everything down. That's an example of a negative feedback loop. So basically take the either consensus consensus builder or the crazy boyfriend or girlfriend and apply that to computer science. Now, some of the pros and cons of control systems are, well, we'll start with the pros. The pros are that computers can respond much more quickly than humans. So that means that, um, for example, in an environment that requires a faster than human response, uh, maybe where there are hazards present, or potentially when working with other dig digital systems, a computer a control system can be a huge pro. They can also run without breaks, so 24 hours, 365 days a year. They are less error prone than humans because they consistently follow a set of rules. They don't, and they don't deviate from those rules unless there's some sort of external malfunction. And they can also work in, in hazardous environments. So you could have a control system operating in like minus 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the Arctic Circle, or about is that like minus 60 degrees, uh, consistently 24 hours, 365 days a year. Whereas a human would freeze in the same environment, it would not be able to optimally perform a the same task. And the cons are technical malfunctions can occur. Also, the systems can't react to unexpected events. So if there is any sort of event that the control system is not programmed to deal with, then it just kind of doesn't do anything or it may not do what you want to do. It also relies on a consistent supply of electricity. So again, that control system operating in minus 60 degree temperatures in the Arctic Circle still needs to have a consistent supply of electricity um, that's not going to run out of charge. Also, a control system could be more expensive than hiring a human, depending on the sophistication of that solution. Now, the next thing you want to talk about are centralized and distributed control systems. This is like a very small part of the topic, but it's still something that is in the curriculum. Now, a centralized system is going to be what we've seen before, where we have basically one microprocessor. All of the input, the you have an input or a variety of inputs that are all feeding into that one processor. And then we have an output or a series of outputs, again, originating from that processor. This is going to be centralized. Now, a distributed system uh, means that we have different processors, uh, all taking inputs, all taking different inputs, and they're all working together in tandem towards a common goal. So a distributed system is going to have multiple processors, most, multiple inputs going into these processors, but ideally they should all be working together to complete a common task. Now the pros and cons of a centralized system are they're easier to maintain and troubleshoot because you only have one processor um, and you have more control um, just because it's easier to control one processor than many. And the cons are if that processor fails or if any of the sensors or actuators fail, the whole system fails because that consists of the whole system. Um, you have, I mean, there's less flexibility. You don't have different processors that can do different tasks at the same time. And you may have less power just depending on um, whether you, I guess, depending on how many actuators you can control. So some of the pros of distributed systems could be that you have a shared process, processing load. So you have multiple processors that can take in and process the digital input that your variety of sensors and actuators may have, um, or rather, I guess, the variety of, that your variety of sensors may have. You have more reliability because you can set up a distributed system so that if one processor fails, the other one will take on that load or the others will take on that load. And you have flexibility. So multiple processors means that more and different types of tasks can be completed uh, simultaneously. Now the cons are that such systems can be harder to maintain. It's because you have a lot more um, processors, um, potentially sensors and actuators. Also, you might need more complex software in order to operate uh, more larger and more complex distributed systems. Now, what's important to know about these types of systems, so centralized and distributed systems, is that we can be talking about uh, electrical, so basically things like robots, um, just electrical physical systems, or we could be just talking about software. And we can apply the paradigm of centralized and distributed systems to purely software or also just to physical devices that we're working with. So you might see questions that are, relating, are related to 
a software program or series of software programs that are organized into centralized or distributed systems. Now, the last topic, which is kind of random, is autonomous agents. So autonomous agents are defined as software programs which respond to states and events in their environment, independent from direct instruction by the user or owner of the agent, but acting on behalf and in the interest of the owner. So in a nutshell, what this means is autonomous agents are either software programs or devices or software driven devices that work together to accomplish some task without the continuous instruction from the, uh, the user. So some examples include recommendation systems, uh, autonomous drone swarms, and search engine crawlers. These are all software-based and they all have a task that they need to complete, but they are not constantly being operated or used by a user. They're instead, giving, they're instead given a set of instructions on how to react in any given set of situations. Um, again, a self-driving car, which would be a singular autonomous agent, is another example of that. So it basically uses machine learning and a combination of algorithmic techniques to make decisions in any given situation to drive a car without the continuous instruction from a user. Now, there are four basic uh, characteristics of autonomous agents. One is autonomy. So it can independently select subtasks in order to achieve overarching goals. So your overarching goal may be to like bomb an enemy tank, but the an autonomous agent, maybe an autonomous drone, can select the path, the geographic path it takes to get to that uh, tank, and then basically from what angle it decides to drop its bomb. Um, it's reactive, it senses environment and reacts based on this input. So an autonomous agent, so an autonomous drone, it could maybe react to wind and uh, change the movement of its rotors accordingly. Um, concurrency and sociality. So this is particularly true when we're working with multiple dro drones or multiple agents. So again, going back to our drone example, if we had if we had an autonomous drone swarm, they could work together and they could work together to accomplish a task. So if that uh, task is basically to take out a, um, I don't know, like a fleet of tanks, they could basically all work together and every, and, in drones can work, drones in a drone swarm can work in pairs, one to distract the tank, another to bomb the tank. So they're all working together at the same time to accomplish that goal. Finally, persistence. So that basically means that an autonomous agent, which again, going back to our drone example, will consistently work to pursue the goal. It will not give up if it can't bomb the tank, unless it has pre-programmed instructions to, to do something else, it is not going to stop until it is either blown out of the air or has accomplished the task. So that's basically what you need to know about autonomous agents. Now I've got a, uh, a list of IB questions with the answers um, taken from old IB exams. Again, I don't really go through them for copyright reasons, um, but that is the end of topic seven. Um, if you found this to be a value and would like to see more videos like this, please remember, please remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, you, can also, uh, you can also get into the Discord. You can also sign up for the Discord in order to ask IB related questions. You can check the description for that. Also, the links to the slideshow will be in the description so that you can see all these other, these IB questions and uh, the answers as well. Have a nice day.